Welcome, everyone. My name is Pastor Trish Geis of York Springs United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for joining me today. We are in week four of our Easter challenge, and today we are talking about the mission. Now, I want to get pretty serious with you right off the bat, and I want to ask you a question. What would you do if you were told that you had only 20 minutes left to live? What would you do? When Cynthia Manley realized that she only had 20 minutes left to live, the first thing she thought she should do is text her daughters, send them a message that they could keep. So she texted her first daughter, Alana, uh, who was a student at Seattle, Washington, or Seattle University, excuse me. She said, stay strong, and no matter what happens, take care of you and sis. Find a way to get to California and to be together soon and be a family. I love you so much. She texted then her other daughter, Alyssa, and said, no matter what happens, get your degree, have a good life, be successful, and take care of your sister. Now, as it turned out, thankfully, Cynthia ended up having a lot longer than 20 minutes to live. In fact, she and most of the state of Hawaii are still alive today. That's right. Maybe you remember hearing about this in January of 2018 when a state worker chose the wrong menu item for the state alert system and sent out an alert to the entire island saying, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. So for about a half hour, the whole state of Hawaii is thinking in a bit of a panic, of course, we're all going to die by a nuclear blast. Now, fortunately, there was a happy ending to this story. Everybody was okay. Maybe not the guy who sent out the wrong (laughs) message. But in fact, I can't help but wonder and think that this was probably a gift to many of those people. Much like the time that we're in right now, those 20 minutes would have caused them all to stop and think about what is most important in their lives. What matters at that very moment? I, I do wonder what I would do. I would like to think that I would do the same as Cynthia, and I would reach out to my closest family members and tell them how much I love them, and I'm proud of them, encourage them that they can still live this life without me, um, tell them that it's all going to be okay. But I'd also like to think that some way, somehow, I would find a very large crowd of people and just give my best sermon, my very last altar call, so that even more people could hopefully know about Jesus Christ Either way, just the thought of thinking that we might only have 20 minutes left to live. Man, that really does help you to put in perspective what's important to you. Um, but also, man, what are you doing right now? What if, if somebody told you right now, only 20 minutes left, what are you doing right this very second? I think that that alert is not altogether unlike an alert that is in the Bible. Uh, it's a bi- alert in the Bible that really should sort of grab a hold of us, maybe even shake us a little bit, but should really help us to guide and, and live our whole lives the way God expects us to do. Um, whether it happens in 20 minutes or in 20 years, one way or another, one day, we are all going to stand before God, and we're going to have to give an account of our lives. Jesus may return in a few weeks. It may be a few centuries. We don't know when that is going to be, but we do know that we are not going to be here forever. We are absolutely certain of that. If you follow Jesus, the conversation on that day when you get to heaven, when you meet Jesus face to face, is somewhat early, already loosely scripted. And it goes a little something like this from Matthew 25, 23. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Come and share your master's happiness. That line just sounds so good. I like that. It is only by faith in Jesus that we know we can get to heaven. But there are three things you can affect that will last well beyond your time here on earth. And those three things are, first off, who you become in Christ, right? Who you become in Christ. Secondly, the glory you bring to his name. And thirdly, the way you have touched others' lives. Now, I'm not certain if your dog or your cat is going to go to heaven. I'd like to think so because they are God's creations too. I do know your stuff is not going to go to heaven. And I most of all know that you, me, God, and everyone, we are eternal. We are eternal because his glory endures forever. Everything we do to add to God's glory 
also endures forever. Because you last forever, everything you do to change, grow, and become more like Jesus Christ is also going to last forever. And because the people around you are eternal, every time you touch someone's life, that is going to go on and on and on and on. So today I want to talk about touching lives. I want to focus on the impact that we have on others. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 through 11, it says this. Paul says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in these earthly body, in this earthly body. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. Now, what do we do, excuse me, what we do with people doesn't necessarily get us into heaven, right? But it will go with us into heaven. Everyone who believes in Jesus goes to heaven. Everyone who goes to heaven will be rewarded according to what we have done with other people. And so what are we supposed to do with other people? That's the million dollar question, right? What are we supposed to do with them? Well, Paul shows us right here. He says, we work hard to persuade others. Every person we lead to Jesus will spend eternity with him. Just think about that. Every person we lead to Jesus will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. Therefore, is there really anything better to be doing while we're here on this earth? Is there really any better way to be spending your life than to sharing Jesus Christ with everyone you can? I mean, think of it this way. If you have gotten to know who Jesus Christ is, if he has changed your world, if he has freed you from your sin and your guilt and your shame, if he has given you new life, man, then how can you not share that with everyone around you? I mean, just think about that. If, if you are not wanting to share it with everyone around you, then I'm not really sure you know who Jesus is. Because if you know who Jesus is, then you're going to be in line with how he feels. And he wants everyone to know. Because he loves everyone and he wants them to be with him in eternity. So how can we not want everyone to know as well? Now, I wish I could have one uh, simple formula for persuading everybody and anybody. I I wish I could just give that to you. And and I unfortunately do not have that. I'm sorry to say. However, if just telling people how to get to heaven, if that was a way that everyone would just believe and be persuaded, then I truly believe everybody would already know. I really do. But the problem is, is that everybody is at a different point on their faith journey. You know, some people might be ready and they might be raring to go to hear that good news and grab a hold of it and own it. But then there's other people right now who are going to totally oppose it. For whatever reason, they're going to totally oppose it. So I don't have an exact formula for you to use. However, I do have a place where you can begin. A place where you can begin with anyone, literally anyone. It's with five easy to remember words. Now, Craig Groeschel, he uses these words with his volunteers, but I actually think these words, these five great words are wonderful to reach out to other people, to anyone. So these five words, I really believe can open doors. They can open doors um, for atheists. They can open doors for Christians who have sort of faded off from the church. These five simple, easy words, are you ready for them? Here they are. I notice and you matter. I notice and you matter. Now, you may not have all the right answers to everyone's questions. I don't either, to be honest with you. You may not have a persuasive and the perfect speech or the world rocking testimony that's going to get everybody on fire, but you can notice people and let them know that they matter. People respond to that. Almost everyone responds to being considered. Your efforts may or may not lead them to their conversion. We don't really know that. What you do now might only be planting the seed and somebody else waters it and it grows later. But they do care if they are mattered. At least this is a place where we can start. I notice and you matter. I really think it's the little things. I really believe it's the little things that matter. And if you remember in Matthew 25 that I just shared with you, where Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servants, and come and share your master's happiness. If we go down just a few verses from there, Jesus really starts to give an explanation of that day. He says this, then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? 
When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. On the day you meet Jesus face to face, more than anything, you'll care about where you stood with him while you were here on earth. I think the next thing you're going to care about is how you treated others while you were here on earth. The cool thing about this is that the bar is not set all that high to be touching lives. It's not too hard to make someone feel like they matter. It's just really not. Jesus made it very clear. Um, it's not difficult to receive a reward on that last day. In fact, in Matthew 10, 42, he says this, Jesus said, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely get a reward. Do you hear it? A cup of water. That's it. A cup of water, that counts, that counts. That's great, right? Just a cup of water. I love it that Jesus is doing this, that he's making it just plain and simple because the Lord knows that I need a plain and simple and I'm pretty sure most of the people around me and, and most of you probably need a plain and simple too. It's almost like Jesus is saying, just get beyond yourself in some way or another and I'll take it, I'll take it. You just open the door for the man in the wheelchair and boom, it counts right? It counts. If you just smile at the grumpy neighbor with a yippy dog, it counts. If you give your husband a compliment, it counts, right? Even a tiny little compliment can have an eternal impact. A little compliment can really, really, really be a big deal. But here's the problem with this. I think that most of us are sadly self-focused, I kind of think of it like different tiers, like a different level of selfishness. And I'm not saying that God does this. It's nowhere in scripture that God does this. And I'm not saying that God judges us on different tiers of our selfishness. I'm just trying to share this idea to explain how I want to grow and where I want to go in this part of my life. So let's start with the kindergarten of kindness level, right? The kindergarten of kindness level is when you don't shove the people out of your way so that you can get out to recess anymore. You know, you don't shove the people out of your way after the church service so you can hurry up and get out of the parking lot and go wherever you want to go, right? You're past that. Uh, you, you don't all of a sudden have to be the big strong one in the class, right? You're past that. I think most of us have graduated from the kindergarten of kindness. Um, of course, I know <laughs> some people haven't, and some days we even question ourselves, but I really do think most of us have graduated from that level. I would guess that most of us are probably stuck at the elementary level. The elementary level is the kind of selfishness where you let other people go before you, you know how to share well with others. When people are with you, you make every effort to put them first, but like a grade school kid, as soon as they're not with you, they're not on your mind anymore. Maybe you've been stuck at this level for a while. Maybe you've been really wanting to get beyond it. Maybe you've been wanting to, to move up to the next level, to the high school level. In this scenario, we don't do middle school. This is just <laughs> elementary to high school. But maybe you're ready to get there. And I think the high school level of selfishness is when the people who aren't with you, you know, they're not with you any longer in the moment, yet you're still thinking about them. You're still praying for them. You're still considering how you can be a blessing to them, what you can do for them. Now, let me throw this in. The college level of kindness is not only to think about other people often when they aren't with you, but also to sacrifice your own being, your own comfort, and even your own stuff to help others. These are the kind of people who turn their homes into orphanages because they just keep taking on other kids who they know don't have a home. These are the kind of the people who um, move to a third world country to be able to share the kingdom of God with others that normally they'd have no way to, to reach. Of course, Jesus gave us the ultimate example of this college level of kindness by sacrificing his own life for us while we were still enemies of God. Like you gotta, gotta wrap your brains around that a little bit. You know, we were enemies of God, yet Jesus died for us anyways. And again, I'm not saying this is how God judges selfishness or that he has this tier level, but it does give us an idea of how to examine our own selves, how to examine our kindness and how well we're doing with it. If reaching out to others begins with, I notice and you matter, then how does it get to the next step? 
What, what do we do to get to the next step? How do we get beyond the kindergarten kindness and up to the upper levels? How do we get to that college level, right? Again, I don't have a formula, but I do have a method. I do have a method. And you should know that if you actually do what I'm about to tell you, I really mean this. <laughs> if you actually do what I'm about to tell you, your life is going to change radically. It is going to change. It's going to change even more <laughs> what happens on that day when you meet Jesus face to face and have to give an account of how you treated others or how you touched them. Now, you might not be surprised to hear that it has something to do with prayer, but this is not a prayer that you can just say one time, boom, bam, done, and it's over. No, this actually has to become a spiritual discipline for you and for me. It has to become a regular part of your prayer life and a regular part of every day. Pray it every time you see someone in pain. Pray it every time God brings someone to your mind. Pray it every time you notice someone and want to make sure that they know they matter. Now, I promise you, if you will honestly pray this prayer every single day about someone, anyone, your life will change. So are, are you ready? Are, are you ready to graduate from kindergarten and elementary school, maybe even high school? <laughs> Here it is. Here is the prayer that I'm talking about. Lord, what do they need? Now there's a second part to the prayer. So we pray, Lord, what do they need? And then we pray, what should I do? What should I do about that need? Can you, can you already start to see how this is going to change everything for you and for the people you're praying for? Let me just give you a couple examples of how this might work. So let's say you have a friend who just lost a loved one about a month ago. Typically, if you're like me, you're going to go to that loved one or call them up and you're going to say, hey, I'm really sorry about your loss. Please let me know if I can ever help you. And, and they may simply just say, which is the, <laughs> honestly, this is really the um, answer that I often get. Uh, well, just keep praying for me. Just keep praying for us. So you promise that you will. You promise that you're going to pray for them, but then you kind of forget about it, right? And you kind of just let it go. And nothing really happens except for the next time you see the person, you're all of a sudden in the inside of you starting to feel a little awkward. Uh, <laughs> something's not quite right because you know that you never actually prayed for that person, that you never followed through with what they asked you to do. So let's start over in the scenario. What if now this person who lost a loved one, before you say anything to them, you say this prayer, Lord, what do they need? And let's just say God says to you, they need to know that they're not alone. And you say, okay, God, but well, then what do you want me to do about it? And God gives you an idea. So when you call up your loved one, instead of saying, or your friend, instead of saying, hey, um, how can I help you? You know, asking the almost impossible question uh, to answer. What if instead you said, can I take you to lunch? Bam, just like that, you have now graduated. You have now jumped up to the high school level, at least, of kindness. This prayer is so small. It's so simple to say these two things, right? It's so simple, but yet at the same time, it's, it's just so big, so big. Think of how our lives, our church, our community would change if we would all, every one of us, if we would all make this a regular discipline where every day we prayed for someone else. What if this prayer was as much a part of our day as brushing our teeth or combing our hair? And, and I know that's probably really, <laughs> they're probably really bad examples right now because most people probably aren't doing either one of them as they're stuck at home. However, you get my point, right? There's no way that we could literally pray for everyone. And I understand that. You're not going to live long enough to do that. But you can pray for someone and you can literally pray for anyone. It works at so many levels. It can work for the mean person who is working in the government office. I mean, we, we all know this a scenario, right? <laughs> you go into like the unemployment office and everybody's just mean, right? You know, they look so nasty and miserable. And you say, Lord, what do they need right now? And you feel God telling you they need a little compassion. So you say, okay, God, well, what should I do about it? And God gives you an idea. And he says, go up to them and tell them, hey, I notice <laughs> and you matter. And thank you for all the hard work that you are doing. This prayer can also work instantly. Let's say you see a homeless man along the street 
And you say, God, Lord, what does he need? And God says, he needs some dignity. And you say, well, what can I do about that? God gives you an idea. You can walk up to the man, look him in the eye like he's a real human being, being, shake his hand and say, can I pray for you? Bam, just like that, check. That counts too. It counts. The mean lady at the unemployment office counts. The homeless man, it counts. This prayer can even be repeated for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. If you have a daughter who's struggling, if you have a son who's struggling, you can say, Lord, my child is struggling. What does he need? And then it comes to you that this person, this child of yours, just needs to know that you are there no matter what happens. And you say, then what should I do about that need, God? What should I do with that? And God says, you need to find a way to reach out to that child every single day and keep praying. And just like that, check, it counts too. It counts too. It can happen with that jerk or at school or at work, that person you, you just don't like, that nobody likes, right? You know, the miserable person. And you pray, God, what does that person need? And God says, he needs a hug. And you pray, well, God, then please bring somebody to, to hug him. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe it's you. Maybe you're supposed to hug him, right? You know, just do it. I mean, it's an effective prayer. But I want to warn you, I really want to be serious here for a moment, I want to warn you that it's also dangerous prayer. And I say that because of what I find in James. James 4, 17 says this. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, here it is. It is sin for them. So if you know the good that you're supposed to be doing, but you choose not to do it, it's a sin. The danger with praying this prayer is that as things come to mind, you got to follow them. You got to listen and you got to do it. Even if you don't want to give that jerk a hug and God tells you to, give him a hug anyways. For example, let's, let's take this scenario. What if it went something like this? God, what is that couple that you brought to mind, to my mind a little earlier today? What do they need? And God says, they need a car for their daughter. And you say, okay, God, what do you want me to do about that? And God says, give them one. Now, all of a sudden, we are playing with the big boys of faith. Right now, we're at the college level. We've even graduated from master school, right? So look, <laughs> I know I'm being a little silly with some of these things, but I just, I want you to consider doing this with me. Would you just start by finding one person every day where your actions say, I notice and you matter. Then would you pray these prayers with me just once a day for one person a day? That's all you need. One person for one person a day. So we say, I notice and you matter. And then we pray, Lord, what do they need and what do I do about it? Maybe you'll even pray for the same person day after day or for weeks at a time. And, and I know sometimes it seems like God doesn't always answer our prayers or it takes so long for him to answer our prayers. But, you know, I, I will just say this. I really don't think that God is going to ask you to buy somebody a car. <laughs> I guess he could, but that's probably not real reasonable. But I am concerned that sooner or later, or excuse me, I am certain that sooner or later, God is definitely going to bring the right idea for us, the right idea of something that we can do to help fulfill the need of the person we're praying for. And if you will do this with me, if you will do this on that last day, when we meet Jesus in heaven, I, I, I just get the chills every time I think about that because, man, how cool is that? Every time I, I find someone passing away, especially somebody I love or care about, and I think about that moment that they got to meet Jesus face to face, I just, I'm overwhelmed by it. Like, I can't even fathom it. It's just such a cool and wonderful and warm and just a great feeling. Like, then that's just in my imagination. Can you imagine when I actually get there, what it's going to feel like? But when we get there, when we get there, we are going to be so glad that we learned these five simple words, <laughs> I notice and you matter. And we're going to be so glad that we prayed this simple prayer, Lord, what is their need and what in the world can I do about it? And look, until those last days, we're going to have a lifetime full, packed full of ministry stories, of stories of ways that we have touched lives. So, so look, this is my challenge to you for this week. Every week I've been giving you a challenge. Uh, last week was about sticking in the Bible for at least 10 minutes a day and praying for five, getting in the word. This week, this is your challenge. This is your challenge. And I promise you it's not hard. 
but you got to be honest with it and you got to stick with it. If you really want to see a difference, if you really want to see how it's kind of going to work, you've got to stick with it. So this is my challenge. Let's try it every day this week and see if anything happens. And if this could become our daily discipline, I believe every single one of us will have scores of stories to tell about how God used us, how he included us, how he probably scared the dickens out of us, and how he came through for even us. You know, this could be an awesome adventure. And, and it kind of makes me sad that we're not gathered together um, for the time being. But you know, if you start now and make this your discipline every day, when we do come back together, we are going to have an amazing joy time, right? We have a time here in this church called Joys and Concerns, and the joys are sharing uh, the way God has been working and the way God has been answering our prayers. And then, of course, our concerns are our prayers that we are, are certainly concerned about and want to lift up to God. But Man, if we would all start doing this right now, by the time we get together, however many more weeks or whatever that'll be, can you think of all the stories we're going to have to share? We might have to have a whole hour just of that, and that would be all right with me. It would be all right with me. So let's try it. Let's try it. And I don't want this just to be a nice sermon. You know, I, and bless your hearts, I really love your encouragement. Oh my goodness, are you helping me? Because I'm sitting in an empty sanctuary, and it is truly strange still after seven weeks to be talking to just a camera. <laughs> So I appreciate your encouraging words, but I don't want this just to be a nice sermon where everybody says, oh, great job, Pastor Trish. That was a very nice sermon. And that's where it stays. I really, really, really am praying that this is the beginning of everything changing for you, for me, for this church, for the church, for God's church, for our whole world. For our whole world. If you didn't get a chance to watch the children's message, please go watch it. It's much like a domino effect. You know, if you set up dominoes and you just knock the first one over, it goes on and on and on and on. And that's what can happen when we touch lives for Jesus Christ. It'll go on and on and on. So, look, this is all we got to do. Let's just show God's love in a practical way. Let's tell people that we notice and they matter. And let's pray this simple prayer. Lord, what do they need and what can I do about it? It's as simple as that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for all the love and kindness that you have shown to us. Thank you for our salvation. That's a huge amount of love and kindness. I pray that you would help us to notice others because they matter, and not just to us, but man, they matter to you. Remind us to seek your will and, and your plans for them. Please show us how we can make a difference and touch every life, or touch one life at least, every day, Father. Let this rock our worlds. Let this change who we are, and let it, most importantly, grow your church, grow your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name, Lord, we pray these things. Amen. Thank you all so much for listening. Please take this challenge with me. Uh, please send me a message if you take this challenge and, and something great starts to happen. I would love to hear the results of your challenges. Even if it's one of the challenges that I gave you in the previous weeks, um, please share them with me. I, I would, again, love to hear it. It would just be encouraging for me, too. So uh, thank you, and God bless, and take care, everyone.